This is Technoscald. Welcome to my DM preparation session. I run several campaigns a week. One of those is with some friends. Uh, it's non-adventurers league, unlike my other campaigns. It's a campaign that's sort of inspired by the default world implied by Dwarf Fortress. Um, originally, I had some other kind of Tolkien-esque elements in mind, but the players. Uh, as, of course, they will and should have kind of shaped that direction a little bit differently. So now we are at about fifth level. They are in what is more or less the Underdark. In my world, the dwarves prefer to live underground. And so they are traveling between a trading outpost near the surface called, conveniently enough, Trader's Rock and an underground city called Bladeforge to deliver the news of what had happened in sort of the first, let's call it the first chapter, the first act of the campaign. I like to use checklist from Mike Shea, a.k.a. Slife Flourish, uh, called the Lazy Dungeon Master's Checklist. I'm going to simplify this a little bit, but the idea is here, right? Review the characters create a strong start, outline potential scenes, secrets and clues, fantastic locations, important NBCs, relevant monsters, and magic item rewards. So let's take a quick look. I keep my notes on my characters in Google Docs. I've got several. I've got a half-orc barbarian called Nachnin, played by my friend Alex, who is a half-orc who is very much about... Um, going on, um, might think of it as sort of a walkabout. He's trying to bring back stories to his tribe, uh, bring back maybe the honor and glory of having defeated some great monsters in his mind. The larger the monster, the more worthy it is. And maybe discover something about himself along the way. They don't have a written tradition in his nomadic tribe. So he's been thinking about what tattoos and ritual scarification he's going to have when he comes back. Remora Spring Wrench, played by my buddy Scott, is a gnome rogue, a mastermind rogue, who is sort of a child of spies herself. They kind of ran a resistance network against drow occupation and now she's off on something like spring break or as we jokingly sometimes call it gnome springa um, and uh, I'm not really sure yet kind of what her goals are and I th honestly think that she doesn't either. Todd Gordon played by my friend Claire is a half-orc necromancer wizard who doesn't really like necromancy, he just wants to make friends, and when he ran away from his evil parents, his mother and stepfather, he decided to run away with a book, sort of a necromancy for dummies, and really he's just kind of along for the ride. And to be fair, Claire's a new player, so I think there's a little bit of her trying to, uh, you know, make some friends and learn the game she, uh, along with us. Professor Thurjust actually has like five names. I can't remember them all, and it doesn't matter. I think he adds them on every time. It's not going to be in today's session, unfortunately, because Chris couldn't be here, but he is basically a history professor, a gnome who specializes in something like dwarven sociology and government and culture. He's actually much more involved than that. Not Probably because the player himself is a PhD student studying law and something along those lines. It's a little bit beyond my ability to understand. And then finally, o Oscar. Oscar Stormshield is the one dwarf in the party in a dwarven-themed campaign who is a Tempest cleric, worshiper of Thor, and in many ways one of the, the central characters, at least for this part of the campaign. So that's who we're dealing with. Oh, he's looking for the Jan Graper, which are sort of Thor's gauntlets, uh, which will be, we've started to foreshadow somewhat coming up. 
create a strong start. Well, where we left off the last campaign, they were just about to descend into a mine. This mine in the is is a dungeon. It's already in the Underdark, the entrance itself. They've descended in. They have seen and, and heard reports of miners coming out crazed and attacking villagers. And when they defeated some of these crazed miners and they had ambushed the food wagons, the lunch wagons that were on their way to the mine, every time they killed one of the crazed miners, the pickaxe that they were holding would suddenly... Uh, break apart and a big flash of light and some sort of smoke or evil spirit evaporated out of it. So that's what they're investigating. Just as they got to the entrance, they could hear uh, the rogue heard some goblins whispering to each other up front about who's going to clean up the mess. So we'll see where that's going to go. So that's the characters in the strong start. Now I like to keep track in Trello of what's happening. So potential scenes... I started with this some this uh, uh, idea from Cobalt Press. No, it wasn't Cobalt Press. Anyway, it was a, a GM prep product I got that had this story seed in there, and I'm taking pieces of it, at least that first paragraph of the PCs coming across a group of crazed miners attacking a family. In this case, it was a family that was bringing them food. Weapon bursts into flames, crumbles into ashes, and the evil spirit flies away into the night sky. So they're going to go through that. I'm going to talk in a minute about how they're going to probably deal with that. What I expect, anyway. The situation I'm going to present them with, and I will see how they react to it. When they're done, let's see, they already had the trade caravan, so we're going to archive that card. I think they are likely to head back... To nearby village to report move that up to the top that's what I think is the most likely um, the scenes within here are not really scenes but a dungeon and I'm going to develop that dungeon over here we're gonna call this it's a five-room dungeon so if, the five-room dungeon concept but to change all of oh, quite a bit of this is basically you have a the first room is a guardian of some sort. The second room is a puzzle or role playing challenge. This third room either is a, a sort of a change up, a twist in the story, or a setback, maybe. The fourth is the what we think of as the climax or boss fight or whatever passes for that sort of climax in your dungeon. And then the fifth is really the twist. The things aren't all as they seem, etc. So at first, normally we have five players today we're going to have four so i just want to double check my encounter balance i've got level five four players are level five and i just want to make sure that the math is not overwhelmingly boring or too challenging hard that's fine i could probably make it a little bit more difficult but honestly i don't want to be too focused on combat the let's go back here the second part there's going to be a scared dwarf who is not crazed who's hiding in a crate as they come in they're going to hear him bumping around and so forth there as they go further in some of the braces will collapse i need to make sure to uh let's see you want to edit this give warnings about the beams buckling. In the boss fight, I've ch been thinking about this all week. And I'm going to change what this is. So the climax, I wanted to focus on undead. The theme, but one of the big themes of this campaign is Orcus trying to come back into the world. And so I want to deal with that. I want to make sure that the they keep in mind this idea of undead what i think i'm going to do let's do a new thing here reset filters undead oh i need to do that there we go that's what we need some ghasts and ghouls and a flame skull so i want a flame skull 
as kind of the main bad guy there. But I think also a couple of guests. Is that too much? Yeah, because they're short one. How about one guest? Yeah, that'll be good. One flame skull, one ghast, and four ghouls. The thing about ghasts and ghouls is that they're linked, right? Ghasts give ghouls, uh, I think, advantage against turning undead effects. Or is it the other way around? A gas does kind of inspire a pack of ghouls to... Oh yeah, here we go. The gas and any ghouls within 30 feet of it have advantage on saving throws against effects that turn undead. So that's what we're going to have. And then the idea about the flame skull... is a spellcaster. What I'm imagining in here... Make sure I write this down. Climax. There's a room with that was recently broken into by the miners evil altar with swirling necromantic aura skulls set into wall on round two one of them comes to unlife as a Flame skull. Ghasts and ghouls from the dead miners. I'm going to rely on a lot of my ability to just kind of improvise there. But the idea is there will be this altar in the middle of the room. These dead corpses from around it will rise up as ghasts and ghouls attack the party. On the second round, one of the skulls that is set into the wall, its eyes will flash, flames will erupt around it, and it will come out and start wreaking havoc. And we'll see how they deal with that. I honestly don't know. Part of what I described about the mine is that there was this additional pit further up that they use. There's a joist with a winch and sort of a platform. Um, that's going to be what they think is their way out. Um, after the fight, that's going to crash and fall. It's not going to hit them, but it's going to make it difficult for them to get out, and they'll have to figure a way out. I like the idea from Matt Colville that my job is not to solve problems for the players. My job is to solve their solutions. And so I really don't know what they'll do, but we'll roll with it. Okay, so that's one. When they get back to this village, I think that we had called it Thernjaro, something like that. I don't have notes here. It doesn't matter because what I'm going to do is I love Don John for this. There is a random generator. For towns and cities, that's what I want. It's going to be small, maybe smaller than that. There we go. Dwarf, default culture. Well, let's see, is there anything here that grabs my attention? There we go. Thaldervite, which I'm going to rename. Primarily dwarf, some human and gnome. Most of the buildings are constructed from massive stone blocks governed by the priests of the dominant temple. Which I will make Odin in this case, because in my world the dwarves use the Norse pantheon. Go back here. Nearby village. Notes. I don't remember what I said a minute ago. Thurljarn. I may have to go look back and look at some notes before the actual session. I've got an hour. 22. I'm going to bump that up to maybe 100. Estimated population 100. Priests of Odin. 
Bam. We're good there. Um, where did I write? Oh, I didn't. Did I put in Thorogran? That's what it was, Thorogran. So I wasn't too far off. Okay. And that should be enough. You see, I have a lot of other notes here for other things that I can do in the future. Going back here, secrets and clues. What secrets and clues? This is what I was going to do originally, have their faces become masses of writhing tentacles. But I've decided not to do that. Instead, strange, uh, there we go. Strange metal, tunnels, and it has driven them insane. No, it wasn't a vein of strange metal. It was a necromantic altar. There we go. Perfect. Uh, this is one from a from a random generator I haven't decided to use yet. A lot of the things that I use as seeds for my game preparation come from random generators, especially from Don John, but it could be from the DMG or from other things that uh, I find as I go across the internet. Um, it's not so much about rolling a die and seeing what comes up on the table. It's perusing through them like we saw a minute ago with the villages and seeing what catches my eye, what sparks my imagination. And if I can't decide, sure, I roll a die. A Temple of Lightning has been befouled by fiendish gargoyles. That is um, based on a temple from uh, Dyson Logos. It does some great work. That's going to be actually where we find Yarn Graper. I've been doing some foreshadowing, but that's going to lie under the city to which they're headed, Blade Forge, which is partly going to be based on Grackleslug from Out of the Abyss. What other secrets? Um, what else should we add? Let's see. Well, since I can't decide, D&D Rumor Generator. Look at the, oh that's where it was. This is exactly where I got it before. When you generate a random in, this tool will generate some set of random rumors, and I take from this in this way that I just said. The wizard Anathis possesses a remarkable collection of bizarre inventions and apparat apparati apparatuses. That seems good. Add a card. There we go. Add. What else? On the town square will answer a question, but always lies. That could set up a fun kind of knights and knaves kind of logic puzzle. But I don't know if I want to mess with that right now. Do this again. Harry the Freer has mysteriously become strong enough to wrestle a dragon. No. No dwarf who has entered the Dreaming Forest has ever returned alive. I am grabbing that. There we go. I don't know where these will pop up. That's the fun part of these, is wherever I need them to. Including this village of cannibalistic Grimlocks, which I think will be ruled by an orc, maybe? I think that's what I had said. Goblin bones, crude statue of an octopus in the center. What could that mean? Ruled by a demonic orc barbarian, Tanaruk named Nagrub. Good enough. Again, this is all just material to have on hand so that during the game, when inevitably something happens I wasn't expecting, I can come back, look at my cards here in Trello, and riff on that. For, to keep things going. What else do we have here? Important NPCs. Uh, so I've already stocked up on some NPCs. I have... These are mostly based on the random tables in the Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th Edition, plus some from Donjon. 
and then I go grab something from Pinterest or Google Image Search that reflects kind of what I have in my mind. I think she's actually going to be in the city to where they're headed, so I think she's not going to pop up here. But Asgard will be probably some sort of rogue. Maybe she's hanging out in the town tavern. That'll be good. He's the captain of the city guard. He's who they're going to head to when they go to their... And they go to the city to where they're headed. Then she's the one who runs that city. Otig, a female dwarf bard. Oh, she's definitely going to be available to tell, to reveal secrets as needed. And there we go. If I need to have a few more, then what I do is, again, back here, random generator, NPCs. I don't care about the gender, but I do want them to be dwarves. I do want them to be an NPC class and an adventurer. And just see what grabs my mind here. I've already got a bard and some sort of a rogue. So maybe... I like this one here. Arlat, male dwarf professional. Wears modest garments and a dragon scale cloak. Hmm, where did that come from? Searching for the lost dominion of Tyriandi. That plays right into my professor character, Professor Thurjust. So I'm going to add Arlat. Actually, Ar let's undo that. Let's do it this way. Arlat. When I come in here. Nope, not that way. There we go. More detailed description. Okay. Now, sometimes what I do is I go to the Dungeon Master's Guide and I fill out all of the bonds, the, what is it, the trait, ideal, bond, and flaw. And I think I will do that here, because I've got a little bit of time. Designing NPCs. Bam, there we go. So let's see. He's going to have... What's an unusual feature that may be interested for him? Um, what are we, we already said that he's got... A oh, dragon skull cloak is already pretty noticeable. So we're going to say his appearance... We're just going to grab this part. What else? We've already, we don't need all of his ability. We actually already have his, all of his abilities, so it's fine. Notice, the important thing to notice for these purposes is that he's got high intelligence and low charisma, or no high charisma. He's got, he's basically smart and witty and has nothing else going for him, which is perfect for an NPC because I don't need him to be fighting I don't need him to be saving them. I need him to be a source of information and character development. Talent. What is he good at? Great at solving puzzles. Maybe he will be a resource for them if they get stuck on one. Unlikely with my group, but you always need to be prepared. Mannerisms. Oh, enunciates overly clearly. Arlat makes sure that everyone can understand him as he speaks. Perfect. Interactions with other. This is the kind of personality trait bit. And this is where I do grab my dice. Because... Otherwise, these characters all have a tendency to become a little bit too much like me. Plus, I don't get to use my D12 often enough. Anyway, that's a two. Arrogant. Mm, I'm tired of negative, difficult to deal with NPCs. Let's roll it 11, quiet. He may speak extra clearly, but he doesn't speak loudly. 
and he doesn't say too much. Maybe he's a bit introverted. Go back here. Useful knowledge. We already have secrets that he might know. Ideal. We said he's neutral, so we could be either of these. So we roll a d6. Do either of those look interesting? Live and let live or glory? Oh yeah, live and let live. Now how does this guy have a dragon skull cloak? i got to th be thinking about that. Bond. Again, a d10. 10. Roll twice, ignoring results of 10. Protective of a sentimental keepsake? Well, yeah, he's got a dragon scale cloak. Maybe he didn't find that himself. And the last one. Five. Captivated by a romantic interest. Ooh, maybe somebody else there in the bar. And then finally a flaw. The fun part. The really fun part. Forbidden love or susceptibility to romance. That fits pretty well. That's fine. Okay. This time I'm not going to go grab a image for him. Maybe if he shows up and becomes a recurring character, I might. Or becomes important enough. I already have plans for most of these characters that do have images. Not quite him. Okay. Or NPCs. So use relevant monsters. Already did that as well. Magic item rewards. Well, they're going to be fighting this flame skull and this altar. Um, magic item rewards. Um, what could there be? Let's go to D&D &D Beyond again. Magic items. What seems right? I want something that's a little bit better. They've got magic weapons. They could deal with a little bit more magic, a little bit better armor. At least for the cleric and the rogue. The only thing so boring is just armor plus one. The thing is, the, the magic item has to tell a story, right? It has to be interesting on its own. So, for example, if I put in Elven Chain, the item itself is not really that interesting. But it's Elven Chain. So maybe there's something interesting about why that's down there. Why that would be in here. Alternately, we could get a Wondrous Item, which are my favorite kind. What grabs me as I come through here? Ghost Lantern. I had one of these in my Tomb of Annihilation game. No spoilers. But there is one in that game. That's a good one. So we're going to drop that in here. Magic items, fantastic locations. Magic item. You know what? Oh no, I'm not going to do it like that. I'm going to do it like this. I'm just going to add this link to the ghost lantern here. And I will also add a few potions. Well, there are some interesting potions in there. Doesn't have to be rare. Could be. It's fine. Hmm. I'm getting everything. Okay, no, I wasn't getting everything. Now I'm getting everything. I never. I refuse to put the filter of love in any game that I run. Way too rapey. Regard it as your true love while you're charmed. Nope. 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 Potion of heroism, maybe, but why would it be under there? That's the trick. Potion of longevity, your physical age is reduced. 
one of my characters is a teenager. Not played by a teenager. None of us are that yet, nearly that young. All of us are at least in our 30s, I believe. But it'd be funny if that character drank it and suddenly became a child. Yeah, just for fun. What can happen? I don't know. That's what makes it fun. You play to find out what happens. Okay. And we're pretty well set. I use primarily theater of the mind, so I don't have to, do, for this campaign anyway, so I don't need to design a map. I already have description of what will happen, and based on what they say, when the, the questions that they ask, is there an X in here? And the answer is almost always yes, as long as it's relatively reasonable or fun sounding. They could ask for something crazy. If Is there... I don't know, a barrel full of straw in here. And sometimes I'll just say yes, because clearly they have something in mind for it. Oftentimes they just ask, how, do the, how does the room look? And I kind of have that in my mind, and I can tell that to him. That's enough for t now. Let's see how the session goes later on. Thanks for watching.